Well, good morning. Good to have you with us again this week. And uh, as you can see, we're now outside again, which is great. It's uh, encouraging to be able to get out in this nice weather. And so this is a first for us this year. And so uh, for David and myself, it's good to be outside and, and enjoying a different uh, sort of setting to, to share the message with you this week. So welcome aboard. Good to have you with us. You can turn to Acts chapter 19. We're going to look at a portion, the whole chapter today, and it's a portion of scripture that talks about powers that are at play. And so that's what I've entitled the message today is Powers at Play. And uh, trust that you'll be encouraged and uh, maybe even challenged a little bit by it and just for a good reminder of what uh, is important and what we need to be careful of. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the entirety of chapter 19 today. So we're going to look at it and sort of big picture ideas. And, and so what's going to happen is um, after we read the, the whole chapter together, you're going to have some some questions perhaps that uh, you don't really know, know how that all fits together, or you may have some questions about it. Just encourage you to send me uh, an email uh, and just just ask the questions that you have about it. If, if there's something I don't cover today, because I recognize we're going through it fast. And, uh, and so anyway, we're going to look at 19, chapter 19 of Acts today. Hope you uh, enjoy it and get along uh, for the ride. Last week we talked about Paul ending his second missionary journey and actually we began 
Um, his third one, and so if you look at the map that's up there on the screen now, um, we see that in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, the, the huge geographical area and the time frame that Paul takes to travel is covered in just one verse. And, uh, and so we see that in the, that big red bracket covers the area that Paul um, covered in what was recorded for us in that one verse in chapter 18. And then by contrast to that, look at chapter 19, we're going to be stuck at this one spot called Ephesus, where we, we saw Paul last week, and he said he was going to come back. He didn't take some, so much time there the last time. He's going to spend a lot of time there this time. And chapter 19 talks about Paul being in Ephesus for a significant period of time. So we're going to, today, we are going to zoom in on the city of Ephesus, and as you can see on this map, the second map, that we actually have zoomed in, and uh, perhaps you can even see some of the dotted lines that show all of the, the major trade routes that are going uh, east and west, and the one going north. And so there's actually two giant trade routes that, that culminate in Ephesus, and it's probably connected to the port uh, and the ability to get goods um, onto boats. So we see Ephesus again as a really important city. Remember, it is a big and powerful and influential city in the ancient world. In its day, Ephesus was a really big deal. So Paul arrives there and he's going to spend some time there. And, and he's going to spend time in this city where culture and money and trade and religion and power all meet. It all meets in Ephesus. So as we look at this chapter today, we're going to look at it and remember that, that this is a story that happens over a long period of time. So let's take a, take a moment now. We will read the entirety of chapter 19 together and then we'll pick up from there. Acts chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue, and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn, and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them, and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Acacia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, 
Timothy, and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with a confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis, and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with them have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So as we read about what happens in Ephesus and, and all of the turmoil that, that is a result of Paul being there, um, we want, I just want to remind us of a few things. Last week I showed you these two pictures. One was the picture of the library, that's the one on the left hand side, and then the, the other big building or big, the big structure that's there is the theater. And the theater in Ephesus was an enormous place. It's going to be important in what we see today. And, and if you caught it when we read it, some important things are going to happen there. So, so here's this structure that is really significant in Ephesus. And it's going to be part of the, the narrative or the story that we look at today. So remember those two things, especially the picture of the theater. But here I have for you an even more important structure to the, to the story of today. This, the big picture you see here, is what remains of the temple of Artemis in Ephesus today. It was a huge structure. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a magnificent building. What happened there was not so magnificent. But what has happened over the years is the ground on which it stood has turned to marsh. And as a result, um, it has fallen. And so as the, the foundation became unstable, the, uh, the building itself uh, has fallen to the ground. There's probably a great sermon there somewhere as well about what we build on makes a difference. Anyway, we won't get into that one today. The little inset picture that is there is an artist's rendering of what uh, they think perhaps the structure looked like uh, given by descriptions and, and accounts that they have written down. Uh, but it's an artist's rendering, and that's the best that we've got. So, so if you could sort of cast your eye back there and think, okay, there's what it was like. Why is this important? Well, um, if you remember in the, the reading of that text, in verse 35, it talked about the, the fact that, that 
Ephesus was the place where Artemis is worshipped around the world. And also, it's, it's also known to be a spot where something happened. It's, it talks about the stone that fell from heaven. Uh, and and here's, here's what happened, um, they're, they're quite convinced, it was that at some point, uh, a meteorite fell and landed and, and landed in Ephesus. And the, the mythology goes that this wasn't just a stone, that at the same moment, the goddess Artemis, who's uh, in Roman mythology called Diana, the, the hunter, uh, fell. And so, so because of this great event, this goddess coming to Ephesus and this stone from heaven arriving, uh, Ephesus became famous for that. And so worship of the, the goddess became significant there. Over the years, the twisting of that worship happened. We'll talk about that in a bit when we get to that third section that we want to look at today. So, the, the twisting of this goddess and the worship of it is going to be, be a big part of what we talk about as well. So, today we're going to look at those ideas of the powers at play, though, in, in the story. And I want us to see three important things. We're going to look at those sections just in big chunks. So the first point that I have for you is this. That in verses 1 to 10, this talks about the power that we need. So as we read through the, the text, I hope you were paying attention to what was going on uh, in there. And in verse 2, as Paul arrives and he spends time with the disciples there, and disciples mean student um, or, or learner. Those are the, the words that would be associated with disciples. Those are people that are, that are learning about God and want to learn about God. They're followers of God. They're there. But they've got a sort of semi-full view of who God is. And so Paul's going to come. And he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit um, when, you, when you believed? When you believed in whatever it is you believe. And uh, they, they sort of, their answer is an interesting one. They go, received the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so... Paul, in that moment, recognizes they don't have the, the whole story. They are, they are students in the process of learning and growing in their faith. That's probably encouraging to us, is that we can still be called disciples or followers, even though we have it all figured out. Even though we don't have all the answers to all of the questions that perhaps we have or other people have that they ask us, we can still be called followers. We're students. We're learning were growing. And so that's where they were. But they had this big gap in what they understood. So then Paul starts probing a little bit more and he goes, well, hang on a second. When, when you were baptized, because in the ancient world, when you believed or followed someone, you were baptized, identifying with them. That's why baptism is important even today. When we become followers of Jesus, we get baptized to identify with him and with his church. So that being aside, Paul assumes they've been baptized and they go, well, how, what were you baptized into? And they said the baptism of John. That's John the baptizer whose message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So they're, they're looking for the kingdom. They're thinking, I want to be part of that kingdom. I just don't know what it looks like yet. And they didn't get the whole part about Jesus coming. And so, so Paul just unpacks for them again. Hang on a second. You need to understand this. That the one that John is saying is coming, the kingdom is coming, it's Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. The one that John was preparing the way for has arrived. And, and then the Bible says immediately they, they believed in Jesus. They believed in what all the Paul unpacked for them about Jesus and his perfect life, God with flesh on, dying for our sins, rising again. He gave, they give them the gospel and they believe. And then it's really interesting. Look what happens next. They were baptized in the name of the Lord, verse 5. And, and then it says, And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They began to speak in tongues and prophesying. There's about 12 of them. So, so here's what happens. The Apostle Paul, he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. They identify with his death, burial, resurrection. 
in the waters of baptism. And when Paul um, puts his hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, now here's the question. Why, why here and why now would be a really important thought for us to consider. So, so why tongues and prophesying now and not other places? I think it's really important for us to understand what goes on every time that people in regions accept Christ and the, this this phenomenon, this power of the Holy Spirit is made evident in them. It's a it's a picture to the Jewish community in particular that the gospel isn't just for the Jews; it is actually spread to a new group of people. And as God initiates um, the the spreading of the gospel to new areas and to to, to new places, this picture. It's shown that the gospel has spread and it authenticates their faith and their belief in Jesus as the one sent by God. And so that's what they do. It's a picture that, that the power of God has now come upon them through the Holy Spirit. It's the power that all of us have. It's the power that we have as followers of Christ that have the indwelling Holy Spirit. So that's where they are at and they've, they've had this powerful experience and so I want you just to remember this is the power that we need that that they were about to embark on a journey in the next months that was going to require the Holy Spirit power to be at work in them and as followers of Jesus we need to understand that same basic truth that that if we want to accomplish important, significant, vital things for Jesus. We cannot do it on our own. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, and I'm going to send one when I go to my Father. I'm going to send one that won't be just beside you, but will be in you. That's the Holy Spirit. And it's that power that, that allows us to do anything of significance for God. So, so we need that power and they needed that power if they were going to be the witnesses that God wants them to to be in Ephesus as well because it's a tough tough spot remember Ephesus powerful wealthy and a cross current of religious ideas they were going to be different than most and they were going to have a message that was going to shake up the establishment they were going to need power it was the power that they needed so let's go on Paul goes to the synagogue and he does what he always does. He starts reasoning with them. And, it, and the Bible says that he actually speaks there boldly for three months. So, so he didn't get kicked out right away, which is usual. But he actually spoke there for three months. And remember, they want him to stay before. So they were ready to listen. But then it says this. Look at this. Verse 9. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of and here's an interesting word, the way, capital W. And that was the way Christianity was called. It was called the way, people of the way. And we really are people of the way. Isn't that what Jesus said, that he was the way? We're followers of Jesus. And so that was one way that they were described uh, in the early church. So pushback happens. And what does Paul do? Spends three months reasoning with them. He goes, we're not getting anywhere. And he goes on. And it says he goes to, to a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. The, and, and he just goes to, the gen, to a Gentile place. And he starts teaching there um, as often as he can. And look what it says. And this continued for two years. So here we go. Here's two years, three months at least. So 27 months minimum Paul has now spent in Ephesus. And, he, and, and then it says this, so that all the residents of Asia, that's the province of Asia, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So, so at the end of it, Paul has been able to share the gospel with people that are going to impact the entirety of the, the region. So as they're coming through Ephesus, Paul has the ability and the opportunity to share Jesus and the gospel and the good news and the hope and the peace and the forgiveness and all that stuff that comes through him. And, he, and again, Paul needed, he needed the power of God. So there's the first little thought, the power that is needed. And then let's look at the next little bit. The, the power that should be avoided. And here's a, verses 11 to 20. And here's a really, here's a really, concise synopsis of what's about to 
I'm be unpacked here for us, for, unpacked here for us in, uh, in verses 11 through 20. So, the power that she should be avoided. That God was doing amazing things shouldn't be a surprise to us. That the Holy Spirit doing things that are outside of the ordinary shouldn't be a surprise to us. And that's what it says in verse 11. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And it says even handkerchiefs, now look, look at this, even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skins were carried to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. Paul was, the power of the Holy Spirit through Paul was accomplishing great things. And that would have created some notoriety for sure. So, but let's see what happens here. Because here's, here's the warning. Here's the red flag, the, the buzzer that should be going on in the back of our brains, the power that we ought to be avoiding because here's the deal the power is real it's not made up and i want you to, to to take this next little bit really seriously so in verse 13 and following it talks about there's some itinerant jewish exorcists which is a curious ver word altogether because we're, the jewish people were discouraged from having anything to do with the spiritual realm, particularly demons, and yet they were tied up into it. So some Jewish people there, and they had some sort of sort of gig going where they were casting out demons. And it goes on, it, and it describes who they are and who they were. And it, so it says, there were seven sons of uh, the Jewish high priest named uh, Siva who were doing this. And, and they had this formula figured out. So they said, they were they're going around saying stuff like this as they're connecting themselves to Paul. They're saying, uh, by the name of this, this God, Jesus, who Paul has talked about, I cast you out. That was sort of their... That was their sort of secret weapon. They were using those words, those names, to uh, pot potentially try and cast out demons. Now, here's, here's the danger, and, and here's the big danger, I think, that sometimes we get sort of uh, a little blind to, especially in Western culture. But they, they were trying their best to come up with this special formula. But look what it says. But the evil spirit answered them. Look at verse 15. And he says this, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And in that moment, here's where the reality comes. The, the evil spirit talks back to them. And says, I know Jesus. He uses the word to know intimately, to, to really know well, to know everything about. And so, of course, demons know about Jesus. Of course they do. They know about him and they're terrified of him. And then he says this, and I know, the, the King James Version says, and I know, um, the, the ESV, which I use here says and i recognize paul which is a better word than no because it's a different greek word and it's the, the word to be acquainted with so i know all about jesus and i i'm acquainted with paul but who are you guys who are you guys that are messing around with something you shouldn't be messing around with and look what happens and the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them and mastered all of them, all seven of them. It overpowers them and it says this, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So, so whatever happened, I don't, I don't think they went in naked. So something happened after the, the demon overtook them. They tore off their clothes and they probably threw themselves on the ground. So they, they, they literally ran out of the house naked and, and bleeding. And here's, here's for me, here's the warning. Don't mess with these things. Follower of Jesus, they, they have no place in our lives. And let me just share with you from my heart for just a second. Because in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians, it says this, that, that Satan is an angel of light. He's dressed himself, or he appears as an angel of light. Why? Because if he, if he appeared the way he was as the destroyer 
of our souls. We would be terrified of him. We'd have nothing to do with him, but he doesn't do that. He appears as an angel of light. Here's my concern. And here's, here's, my, here's my warning or my admonition to you today. Those seven guys were messing with something they shouldn't have messed around with. They were playing at something. There's no place to play. And here's where our culture sort of fakes people out to get involved in stuff they shouldn't. And, and I, you're, gonna, you're maybe going to think that I'm overreacting, but, but understand what happened there and understand my heart here. Many years ago, Parker Brothers came out with a game called Ouija. And it was literally a Ouija board that, is, that has been used to contact the spirit world for centuries. It wasn't, an, and, and so here's the point. What was a very serious thing, the, the contacting of spirits was turned into a game for kids. And, and many people get involved in playing with, uh, with or, or looking at things like horoscopes and the newspaper, oh, I don't know what my horoscope's about. They think, oh, that's silly, that's foolish. And, and it, you know, in a lot of ways, it kind of is. But there's a darker side to it than that. And so the, the funny part of it or the, 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 the nonsensical part of it only makes us less aware of the dangerous part of it. And there's things like tarot cards and they just all, they're just, they're just fun. It's just a game. It's just a game. There's seances and... You know, people giving you readings and palm readings and all, and all these sort of fun things. But the, the gateway is just always to the same spot. To the one who is wanting to destroy our souls. And we package it as fun. And we mess with things that we ought to avoid. So... That may seem like a really extreme thought, but let me just ask you this question. If you're just doing those things for fun, why are you bothering? If it's just for fun, walk away. Find fun somewhere else. Find enjoyment somewhere else. Find pleasure somewhere else, but don't mess with these things. These three, these three guys, these, these seven guys, they probably wished that they had been finding some other source of income. They needed to avoid that for sure. The seemingly harmless is exceptionally harmful. We need to be really, really careful of that. Okay, so let's keep going. Because what happens next is significant. And, and verse 17 and following says, And this became known to everybody... And, and the fear of God and this whole idea of the fear of the one that has power over these spirits that seem so powerful in the lives of these seven guys. Paul is casting out in the name of Jesus. He has power and authority over them. All of a sudden people realize that, that instead of tracking with these things that are overwhelming them, they, they connect to and they put their faith in the one that has power over those things. And as a result, many people believe, and look at this in verse 18, and confessing and divulging their practices. And a number who had practiced magical arts, King James says curious arts, but, but it's clear it's talking about magic here. Uh, things like um, sorceries, incantations, spells, etc., 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 those sorts of things. That's what people were involved with. There was a lot of people. And if you don't think it was a lot of people, look at this. They brought their books together and burned them inside of everybody. And the value was 50,000 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold as a slave for 30 pieces of silver. So there's a lot of books that were there. A lot of books. 50,000 pieces of silver. And as a result of people putting their faith in Jesus and not in the spirits and not in magic and not in these things. This is the word of the Lord continue to increase and prevail mightily. There's some things that have great power and we miss it in North America, but these are the things that we ought to avoid. My last point. 
And it's a long point, so don't get too excited, but it's a point. And it's from 21 to 41, verses 21 to 41. And it's going to talk about what is now going to happen in the city. And, and here is the, the power of our passions. I want you just to, to get a few things. So Paul stays in Ephesus. He sends um, Timothy and Erastus off to, to Macedonia. He stays in Ephesus for a while longer. So this is beyond that 27 months. He's going to stay. But it says this. There's this great disturbance concerning the way again so here's that same the followers of jesus called the way people of the way all of a sudden there is a problem a great disturbance and there's going to be great pushback and look what happens demetrius who's a silversmith he gets everybody together because here's what's happening they are making a living making up shrines or little models of the temple uh, to Artemis in Ephesus. And then they're making a living out of it. They may be selling it to travelers. They might be selling it to the people there that are worshiping. But that was the way they made their living. And look what it says. Because here we, we get right to the heart of it right off the bat. Look at this. He gets all these guys together. So so Demetrius gets all of the, the craftsmen together. And and it says, and it says that, that the shrines, the, the ones who were making them, it brought no little business to the craftsmen. That means it brought a lot. And it says this, and here's, here's the heart. Here's the passion and the power behind the passion. Look at what it says. He says this, men, you know that from this business, we have our wealth. Ah, there's the motivation. They get to the heart of the matter right away. Guys, this is our wealth. This is how we're getting rich. By making and selling these things. And it says this, and, and you've heard that this Paul guy is pushing back and saying that the, the Artemis isn't a god at all. In fact, there's only one god. It's not Artemis. In fact, it's 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 the god of the universe. And, and it's about this new person called Jesus that Paul has been talking about and that that Artemis isn't a god at all in fact she's just made up in our own minds and we're this is all going to collapse if this guy has any more traction in Ephesus that's a problem that's a big problem for us guys we're going to go bankrupt we got to do something about this so then he says this at the end of it, I like the way he says, so, so here's kind of like, oh yeah, and I forgot this bit. But look what he says. Um, so, so, you know, in verse 27, there's a danger that the trade of ours will come into disrepute. In other words, we're going to get wiped out economically. But this is, but also, oh yeah, and as, as an afterthought, that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that, that she may even be deposed of her magnificence. Oh yeah, and by the way, not only will I lose my money, yeah, people won't worship Artemis anymore either. Like that's number two. That's like that's like a distant second in the 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 value system of these guys. The power of our passion. See, all of a sudden it changes everything. It it changes our whole lifetime. It changes our our strategy. It changes what we do, and it it even changes how we react. And look at what and what happens here is incredible. They say, as a result, oh no, that can't happen. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I want you to, to just not underline that, don't underline that, uh, that name, but what I do want you to do is remember that, that Artemis of the Ephesians is different, much different than Artemis of the Greek way of thinking. That in fact, the way the people talk about Artemis is this is this different deity. And so what's happened is, I think, probably, is as different cultures have come through Ephesus, it has twisted this, this Greek mythological feature, creature, into something different. Um, adults, if you're interested, you can see, um, if you just Google Artemis of the Ephesians, make sure you Google the whole thing. Um, you will see 
how she has changed from a huntress and a goddess of childbirth to a fertility goddess and all of the all of the the really pagan ways of of celebrating and worshiping a goddess of fertility has come into play and it will be obvious if you see some of the pictures of the statues as to what she is all about and she's very different she is a unique goddess to this city so i just say that to say this that that it's this twisted fertility goddess cult that brings all kinds of immorality that is now being held on to tightly by the city because mostly of the economic implications, not because they even actually believe much. So, so basically what happens is the place goes in an uproar and, and they all take, they take a bunch of Paul's associates and they take them to that theater that we talked about or showed you the picture of. And, and they take him there. Paul wants to go and his friends say, no, 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 you can't go. You can't go there um, because you'll get taken out. That theater held over 20,000 people. But I love what comes across here. Paul goes there. But he goes there amidst a crowd that doesn't even know why they're there. Look at verse 32. It even tells us this, that the people just get carried along with the, with the exuberance and the attraction of a mob scene. And that mob mentality translates into a whole bunch of people yelling and screaming and being there. And they don't even know why they're there. They certainly don't believe that they're there for all the right reasons because they don't even know why they're there. But there is the herd mentality. And that's a dangerous thing to do too. So be careful. Anyway, um, they, this guy, Alexander, they stand, he stands up to speak and try and defend Paul and the gospel and, and what they're doing and, and not, as not a big problem and certainly nothing illegal. And they have nothing to do with him, the Bible says, because he's Jewish. So clearly he was wearing something that identified him as a Jewish person. And then for two hours, now here's commitment. If it's nothing else, if it's nothing else, because here's the deal. I mean, if we, if we do anything for two hours, but we're committed to it. And, and here's what they did. They wouldn't even let him speak. And they, they cried out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two solid hours. Most of the people didn't even know why they're there. And they find themselves in this mob scene and they're calling it great as, the, as Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. They're not even sure why they're doing it. It's kind of sad. It's kind of sad because that's kind of our culture today, isn't it? We get sucked along with the noisy crowd and we get dragged along and into their way of thinking. And we're not even sure we believe what they are saying, but, but it seems to be the popular thing to do. And... So it's just easier to go along with the mob than to fight against them. And our, the passions that we have aren't always well placed and the power of them can be overwhelming. We need to be careful of that. So, end of the story. Verses 35 to 41. The town clerk finally gets a word in entrance, gets 20,000 people quiet. Don't know how you do that, but um, Maybe he handed out snacks. I don't know. But he got them to be quiet. He brings them to order. And he, he basically comes to some conclusions. He says, hey, hang on a second. These guys that you're, you're all mad at, they haven't done anything wrong. They haven't been blasphemous to our, our goddess. And, and it's right here that he says, everybody knows that our goddess is awesome. And, um, and the stone that fell from heaven, you know, we all know it's, it's, it's here. That, and this, what, that's what's made us famous. And these guys haven't said anything against them which is true. All they've done is shown that Jesus is better. That Jesus is the one that actually brings forgiveness. That Jesus is the one that's actually worthy of worship. But they haven't said anything against our goddess, the clerk says. And then he goes, and he's probably in the back of his mind thinking, hang on a second. A little while ago, Philippi had to apologize to these guys. 
Um, and and when they were in Corinth, Gallio, who was now the the guy in charge, actually offered the same kind of protection to to this guy as to all the Jewish people. We'd better be careful about this, or Rome's going to be upset. In fact, he says this: we need to be careful because we are close to being called rioters right now. We have stirred up trouble for no reason, and. And Demetrius and you guys, if there's anything that you need to do legally, if these guys break the law, you need to take them to court. We don't deal with it here. And they says, now go home. <laughs> Just stop. Just stop. Cut it out. Go home. And the end of the story is this, that, that Paul gets that same protection again. The gospel, while it's not, it's not necessarily accepted by this guy, gets the protection of this guy and says, if these guys do anything illegal, take them to court. But right now, they're not doing anything. And so, in this great city, this huge city, that is so wrapped up in magic and, and things that are so opposed to God, in fact, anti-God, in this place where it is full of deities and deity worship, in this place that they're there's this cross-cultural malaise and this mixing pot of all kinds of ideologies in there. The Apostle Paul has this great opportunity for two and a half years almost, being able to share the good news of Jesus in this most strategic place so that, that literally thousands of people over the, the whole region of Asia get to hear about Jesus. And Paul, in spite of all of the pushback and all of the struggles, I'm sure he says it's worth it. And Paul, in so many ways, gave up his life for the sake of the gospel. And he spent a good portion of time in this really pagan culture, taking the time to tell him about Jesus. He took the time to make him famous. Let me pray and we're done. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that you've blessed us with it and for the encouragement. God, help us to be, to be reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit this week in our lives and, and give us the power to, to stand up for what is true and to say no to what is wrong. God, help us to avoid the powers that, 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 that push against us and, and our own dark hearts and those that are opposed to you. God, I pray you help us to, to say no to those. And God, help us to be ever mindful of the motivations of our hearts. And, and let the motivation of our hearts simply be to make Jesus famous wherever we go. Help us this week to please him. God, help us to live lives that honor and glorify you every single day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.